Hello and uh, thanks for watching. Uh, this video will be some explanations to the GMAT official guide, uh, the 11th, 12th, and 13th editions. I'll address that in a minute. And what this video, as well as my uh, couple of other videos, will be explanations to the trickiest uh, problem solving questions from the diagnostic test in the GMAT official guides. It does say 11th, 12th, and 13th edition. Um, as of this taping, the 13th edition has yet to be released. It should be released uh, eventually. And I'm fairly sure, though, that the diagnostic will be the same uh, because it was the same in the 11th as it was in the 12th. So I'm figuring it's going to be the same in the 13th as well. Uh, regardless, any stud anybody studying for the GMAT definitely needs to purchase the latest edition. I think that the 13th edition should be out sometime in uh, April or May of 2012. Um, and again, with this video, as well as the uh, couple of other videos, will be explanations uh, to some what I consider the trickiest problems, and this video will cover two of them. In addition, what this video is, is a continuation of my Ultimate Quant Review, or UQR, Ultimate Quant Review Free Preview. So my previous two videos um, represented both an introduction and a free preview uh, to my GMAT online math course, uh, which again should be coming out a little bit in a couple of months, sometime in 2012. And what this video and the future videos will do is demonstrate how a UQR graduate would attack some of the tricky questions from the diagnostic, okay? Now, uh, for those of you already familiar uh, with kind of how this runs, you'll know that the best way to appreciate this is to download and print from my website where it says UQR questions and the UQR manual. It's totally optional. You absolutely don't have to do that. Um, but, you know, uh, it'll actually show you the questions that we're going to be working out of in this video and the future videos as well. And the UQR manual Manual will include a uh, table of contents that describes everything that goes into my course. It does not have the entire training manual. All it really does has a preview of the manual and the table of contents. And again, if you want to see more on what I'm talking about, please check out my previous two videos uh, and they go into how the actual course will run. Again, what this video and the future videos will do is show you how a UQR graduate would attack some of the trickiest questions on the test. I'm not going to teach you how to approach these questions. That's a little bit different. Okay. In other words, I'm going to show you how to quickly, uh, how a, a UQR graduate will quickly uh, check out, uh, attack these questions. So that being said, uh, let's go to this first question, please. And this will be part of your packet UQR questions, what you're seeing on the screen now. So again, this is from the GMAT official guide, the diagnostic test, and we're going to talk about question number seven. Uh, but, but before we do, from the GMAT training manual, your table of contents, okay? Uh, those of you who have seen my introductory video, you're familiar with this idea of the trigger method. And one of the top 14 triggers, number 14, is probability. Okay, as soon as you see probability, like if I go down to this question here, probability, okay, that's a trigger for me to apply the single event or my killer five-step multiple event method. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate in this video. So that's a top 14 trigger. In addition, in the actual lessons, of course, I cover probability and multiple events is the second trigger we discuss, where they'll also use the words exactly or or. Because if we go down to the question again, you'll see the word or here. OK, so that being said, what again I'm going to demonstrate is my five-step method for probability of multiple events. OK, and it's a very powerful method that can be used for all of these uh, advanced probability question types. So that being said, let me kind of open up the screen a little bit, make things easier to deal with for everybody. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, so reading this over, um, a certain club has 10 members, including Harry. One of the 10 members is to be chosen at random to be the president. One of the remaining nine members is to be chosen at random to be the secretary. And one of the remaining eight members is to be chosen at random to be the treasurer. What is the probability, there's the trigger right there, probability, major trigger on this test, that Harry will be either 
the member chosen to be the secretary or there's the word or 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 the member chosen to be the treasurer all right so five-step method for probability that I've developed it's really a great way to approach all of these probability of multiple events uh, I'm not going to teach it to you I'm just going to demonstrate it and there's a difference of course so step one to uh, probability of multiple events is to use slots to lay out the number of events since we have three events I'm gonna lay out three slots one two three right somebody being elected president somebody being elected secretary somebody being or chosen I should say treasurer so we have three events Step two is to label the events with one specific example of our desired outcome. So one specific example would be Harry being the secretary. If Harry's going to be the secretary, that means he's not going to be president. So for our first event, what we want for Harry, just one example. This is step two, just labeling the events with one specific example of our desired outcome is that Harry will not be president he will be secretary and he will not be treasurer we're not going to do both events okay step two is just to provide one specific example of our desired outcome this represents one specific example of our desired outcome so now we're on to step three which is to label each event with its relevant probability and multiply across so what's the probability that Harry will not be president well that's got to be nine tenths right there are ten people nine of whom are not Harry Next, now what's the probability that Harry will be elected secretary? Well, as indicated in the question, we have nine people remaining because presumably now somebody has been chosen to be president. And so now we have nine people remaining, only one of whom is Harry. So the probability that Harry will be elected secretary is one ninth. And then now what's the probability he will not be elected treasurer? Well, there are eight people remaining. It's gotta be eight people remaining, right? Eight out of eight which is a little bit weird, I understand. But real quick, it actually makes sense because once Harry is elected secretary, the probability that he's not treasurer has got to be 100%, which is one, which is eight out of eight. So that's another reason that actually makes sense. We're not actually done with step three because step three is to actually now multiply across. So multiplying fractions, by the way, uh, you should definitely always look to reduce some, reduce, reduce, reduce. So if I multiply across, I get one tenth. So this one tenth is this one tenth is the probability of Harry not being elected pre president. He is chosen to be secretary, and he's not chosen to be treasurer. One tenth. Well, we're not done. Because as we know, the question doesn't just ask for the probability of secretary, they also ask for or treasurer. So now this brings us to step four, which is determine the number of ways in which we can have our desired outcome. We've just written down one way in which we can have our desired outcome, but now we have to write down the other way where he's elected treasurer. So now doing that again, we have three events. We don't want him to be president. Now we don't want him to be secretary, but we do want him to be treasurer probability of not president we know is nine tenths probability of not secretary is eight ninths probability of treasurer one eighth multiplying across by reducing those go out those go out those go out so we get one tenth that's the probability that Harry will be chosen to be treasurer that's step four but now we're on to step five which is to combine the two specific probabilities and here we need to add them together now I know that's a little bit odd you might wonder why are we not multiplying that's gonna be part of the course okay that's kinda of beyond the scope of this particular video but my students the UQR students would know that step five in this case is to add the two specific probabilities together you always add the specific probabilities together uh, so it's one tenth plus one tenth which equals two tenths with equals one fifth answer choice E E must be our answer okay and the fact is that would take a student of mine I, I don't know maybe 60 seconds okay as soon as they see this probability of multiple events they knew they know to use this five-step method okay so that's how to attack this very tricky probability question and in this particular video I'm going to actually explain two questions so let's move on to the second question that we can find in our diagnostic please and okay so we have here again the GMAT official guide the diagnostic 10 now question number 10 and again in your GMAT training manual table of contents uh, you'll see a top 14 triggers a geometric figure as soon as you see a geometric figure 
that star is a geometric figure, write down everything related to the figure and look to eyeball. In our table of contents, we also have geometry. And the first trigger is the idea of eyeballing. OK, now look, I know this star, this star here that I have, uh, that is not an exact perfect representation of what's in the official guide, but it's close enough for jazz. OK, that, that's definitely going to be good enough. Um, so uh, let's go on to the question and talk about how we're going to attack this. All right. So uh, by the way, if you were to look in the um, uh, the uh, excuse me, if you were to take a look at this, oh, let's see if I can adjust this just a little bit. Bam. Okay, better. Um, if you were to look at the explanations for this question in the diagnostic, it is awful. But here's what you need to know about geometry in problem solving specifically. Problem solving geometry is drawn to scale. So what that means is sometimes you can eyeball the figure. In addition, my students know, and I discussed the following in my very first video and when I, in the free preview for the UQR, my students know not to just read the question, but to glance at the answers. And if you look at these answers, look how far apart these answer choices are. This is just designed to guesstimate. There's no way you should do all the math here. Okay, All of the math in the explanation in the actual uh, official guide would take about three minutes, even if you knew how to do it right away. That's just not realistic. You really have two minutes to do the question. And what you need to know, again, is that if it's drawn to scale and the answer choices are so far, far apart, I can totally eyeball this figure. So, especially in the book, I think it's realistic to say that each of the angles here, right, Y and Z and W and V and X, each of those angles, especially if you take a look at them uh, more closely in the book, are going to range anywhere between 35 to 40 degrees, right? So I have five of those, so I'm going to multiply that by five. So that's going to give me anywhere between 175 and 200 degrees. That's just an approximate value of all these angles added together. And now if I look to my answer choices, it has to be answer choice C. No other answer is even remotely close. Okay, So it's really important to know how this test works. Okay, It's really important to know, look at the question first and the answer choices. Look at your answer choices, think about them. And then knowing how the test works, knowing that geometry, is just in problem solving, geometry is drawn to scale. It's not drawn to scale in data sufficiency, not in data sufficiency, but it is um, in problem solving, and you definitely want to use that. So I hope that uh, this brings us to the end of the video. I hope that uh, this video was helpful in seeing kind of how my UQR course would work, as well as just explaining how to really do some of these tricky questions from the diagnostic. And then my two other videos after this one will explain a total of four more of the questions. Each video will have two questions each that I will discuss. Thanks very much for watching. I certainly appreciate your time, and I hope that I was able to help you on your work for the GMAT. Thanks again.